Welcome back, folks, to the WP Tonic this week in WordPress and SAS. It's episode 669. We've got a fantastic guest. We've got Debbie with us, Debbie Levette. And I'm going to let Debbie introduce herself. She's the founder and CEO of Delta CX. We're going to be talking about all things UX. Um, I'm pumped up for the discussion. Debbie's a bit of a character. She's up for it. So, Debbie, would you like to quickly introduce yourself to the tribe? Yeah. Thanks for having me on the show. Good to see you, Jonathan and Spencer. I'm Debbie Levitt. I'm from uh, Delta CX and you can find us at deltacx.com. Basically, we are a full service CX and UX consultancy, helping people with UX and CX projects, uh, helping customers and companies shift towards more customer centricity, helping people find ways to save time and money and uh, improve their business intelligence and risk mitigation through fantastic customer experiences. So I've got over 20 years in strategy, research, and uh, design, though my background is not art. I come from the psychology side, so I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has about UX, including what the heck is that? That's great. And I um, my normal co-host, Stephen, is still sunning himself in Mexico, the swine. And there But, uh, here. Here. but a regular panelist on my Friday round, ta- round table show has agreed to join me, even though he's feeling a little bit poorly. That's Spencer Forum. Spencer, would you like to introduce yourself to the tribe? I want to first say I love Debbie as a guest because she and I share so many commonalities. As I, go, I have a psych background, my whole business revolves around customer experience, but I'm Spence from WPLaunchify.com. Many of you know me already who listen to the show, but I definitely, when we get started, want to ask Debbie to define some things because I think a lot of people don't understand what is CX or UX. I mean, there's a lot of good acronyms there, but. Yes, they love, in that field, they love their acronyms, that's for sure. Uh, Ram, but before we go into the main part of the interview, We've got a message from one of my major sponsors. Be back in a few moments, folks. We're coming back. I just want to point out that Castos is offering a fantastic special offer for the tribe. Plus, if you go to this specific page, there's some other great offers. And also, if you're looking for the best recommendations for a specific plugin or WordPress service, you'll find them on this page. How do you get to that page? That is the question. Well, you go to WP Tonic slash recommendations, and it's all there for you, tribe. So let's go into the meat and potatoes of this interview. So, um, Debbie, um, you, you, I think you're best well known in the UX community as somebody that's not got the best feelings towards design thinking. Uh, um so let's start with that. Uh, first of all, can you tell us um, what you think design thinking is when it comes to UX and um, maybe one or two? Yes, Spencer, what would you? And could we please, for the benefit of the listeners, define CX and UX? Because, let's start well, there. Well, we might be here. Uh, I'll leave you. No, no, no I've got, I'm, uh, I'm I'll, used to short versions. Because, I, will leave, because I, will... I don't think it's well known. Yep. I yep. will leave it to Debbie's discretion. Um, but if Debbie it. wants to cover all that, we'll probably be here for the whole half hour, but I'll leave that to her. So if you want to do that, Debbie, plus tell us what you don't like about this specific genre of the industry. Off, over to you, Debbie. Yeah, sure. So CX and UX are really simple. I don't need all day. CX is customer experience. UX is user experience. I see them as the same thing. Some companies do split them up. They think their CX team are the people who run surveys and they're from the marketing department. And let's try to figure out if people are happy. But I think by the time you're doing that, it's too late. You've already released something to the public that might suck. People are leaving you bad ratings. They're tweeting grumpy crap about you. I feel like that's a little bit reactive. So let's talk about UX, the user experience. And again, to me, I don't differentiate between the two. And the idea for user experience is that it's the more psychology than art of making websites, apps, digital interfaces, and even services user-friendly, 
easy to learn, easy to use, logical, intuitive. Hey, this just works. Hey, this is what I needed. You want people to feel that. Let, let's just call it that in short. Right. So in other words, like in layman's terms, the bottom line is the user's journey is really the thing that is being focused upon. And the differences between the CX and UX aren't really as important because quite frankly, almost every web experience today involves customers or users. It's all it's the They're same humans. thing. Nobody's just building pretty sites to read the blogs on anymore. Nobody right. wants your brochure where they, the, you know, everybody comes to your site with a task to accomplish, whether that task is consuming content or uh, perusing things, you know, deciding to buy and then actually buying. And, and we, we need to make sure everything is built for all of those tasks to make them easy and obvious. So hopefully that definition flies for, for my panel here today. <laughs> and then let's talk about design thinking because design thinking is hot and often talked about, but the amazing thing is that no two people seem to have the same definition of it. So I am against design thinking because what is it? Um, we did an episode on my uh, show, episode 108 on Delta CX YouTube channel called What Isn't Design Thinking? And we read a number of definitions of design thinking and... and they, they were all just, uh, I don't know, just kind of buzzword bingo, I would say. So let me tell you the origins oh, of oh, design you thinking. That? Could, could you say that again? That's so lovely. Buzzword bingo. Design bingo. Buzzword bingo. bingo. Yeah, if you've got a bingo card with typical buzzwords on it, you can win the bingo game because, ooh, hold on. Someone said empathy. Let me mark off empathy. Oh, I, like, she's ooh, got, I like how you have the said, magic fairy dust, too. That's amazing. Yeah, thank oh, she you. Lo Whenever, she, loves, she loves her special effects. Sorry, I, well, no. I decided to put into my live shows the some of the production value people put into pre-recorded shows. So I That's figured, fantastic. why not bring them to life? So, let's, so I just did an article, which you can find on Medium, called Was Design Thinking Designed? to not work. And I think when you take a look at the origins of design thinking, the story is pretty clear. There is a famous design firm called IDEO, I-D-E-O, which many people have heard of. And in the early 2000s, after one of the dot-com crashes, um, <laughs> they found that their business super dropped. You remember the early 2000s, y'all? The three of us were there. I was there. And they found, I had to redefine myself. I don't know about you. And they found that their business had super dropped and they decided instead of selling projects, why don't we sell a methodology? Why don't we be the uh, masters or owners of a methodology? And that will really rake in the bucks. And so they took a term that already existed, which was design thinking, and they changed it so that it was this super watered down Fisher Price version of what they were doing, which was really user centered design, which is what UX people call their process. And so basically by having like U UX the home game, you know, it's like it's like buying the game operation and saying, surely now I'm a surgeon. And so they made this kind of watered down version where things that take me weeks or, or a couple of months to do really well with, as I like to say, science and technique and strategy, <laughs> they were saying you can do in just a few days by getting into a room with sticky notes. And the amazing thing is that um, there's, I even, in my article, I even found that idea was out there saying, we know this doesn't work. We know it's theater at most companies and yet they haven't tried to fix it. So I, I have a hypothesis that design thinking was designed for you to feel addicted to this thing that tells you, you can do what Debbie does. You can do what Debbie does. Just do these five easy steps and get in a room and play some games and you can do what Debbie does. And the reality is that, uh, no offense, but it's hard to do what I do well. Anybody can do what I do, but not everybody's going to do it well. UX is complicated and difficult, and it's like the old Saturday Night Live line. Uh, Toon says the cat can drive, but not very well. <laughs> is so, this like five love languages, the book that comes out? That if, if literally you want to succeed in you need to yeah. use words of affirmation, or you need yeah. to use you know, touch or whatever the five are, because it sounds like what they're saying is there's a professional level of understanding that's required and experience to really do this effectively. But somehow this idea is sold the public or the corporate public on the idea that just pick one of these five boxes and have somebody read off the, you know, what's on the card and everything will be groovy. 
It's pretty, I think it's pretty much that. I think you're not far off because again, I mean, who wouldn't want to be like IDEO? It's like saying you can be a Disney Imagineer. It's incredibly dreamy. It's incredibly seductive. <clears throat> who wouldn't want to buy that book or take that course or get that certificate? So I understand the attraction to it, but I think that it is selling a fantasy. It's selling the fantasy. It's like saying, you know, you can be a dentist by reading this book. You know, you can, and, and so, the, and when you think about IDEO themselves, they they aren't hiring design thinkers necessarily. They were hiring um, psychologists, industrial designers, human factors engineers. They weren't, you know, hiring John and Spencer who took a two day course in design thinking. And but they were selling it like if you take this course, you can do what we do. And and my point in my article was, what. What innovative company like IDEA would invent something that puts them out of business? They would have to leave something out so that you would always need them. It's like how my grandmother never told you there was coffee in her chocolate cake, and that's why it tasted so good. Right. So are you suggesting that the, sorry, John, uh, this is this fits into the framework of large scale companies or enterprises, probably who are hiring maybe from within for doing these, let's just call it like, you know, the design workshops. process workshops versus what could have, would have, in your opinion, should be the case, which is that they really need to enlist the aid of a specialist, somebody with your level of experience who has an understanding of the, the deeper processes and the deeper ways that this work out. And, and a question that comes to mind in that regard is, <clears throat> can you contrast this conversation to like, what people in the WordPress space, if that's something you're familiar with, will be doing. So yeah. we've got all these WYSIWYG tools in the block builder, but in the corporate space, they're not really using WordPress in the same way. You know, maybe it's sure. one of 10,000 things they're using. So how do these uh, problems or issues or concerns apply in maybe the design space of WordPress? As well. Yeah, I think that because design thinking is hot, everybody's claiming to do it. So it could even be WordPress developers and WordPress web designers out there who are now saying, I'm a design thinker. And I say, whatever. But I think when you think about WordPress, and I certainly know a couple of things about WordPress. I've been using it for many years. And my boyfriend is uh, not only uh, running his own WordPress design company, but he's heavily involved with WordPress on the Polyglots team. He uh, translates WordPress elements into Italian, which means he also gets uh, sneak previews of things. And so um, so if you ever see at Pier Mario ever in the uh, automatic Slack, that is my boyfriend and love him. Hi, honey. And so um, I'm on a WordPress podcast tonight, honey. Can't hear you. Have my monitors in. Um, so <laughs> what was that? The, that was uh, hydrogen peroxide? What is that? <laughs> I, I was I was I was talking to my friend here who uh, shows up in the. It's my, yes, exactly. Uh, I can say he is physically located there. I can have him jump into the frame if you want to see a human. But um, basically, I would say for for the WordPress people out there, it's kind of like if you, you, you we've all worked with that person who writes a WordPress blog post and then goes, "I'm a WordPress developer." You know, right, like they I, go. I've got one here, but there we are. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, um... Right. What just happened? I, I, I just interrupted. That's why. Okay, <laughs> just checking. All right. Uh, um, so, um, would just to finish off the first half of the interview, Debbie, um, could you also explain maybe what you see as the difference between somebody that designs interface interfaces and what we've been talking so far in this interview? Because I think there is a difference, but you do get people that can combine both or, but there's a lot of, um, I think, confusion over that. Can you, can you attempt to try and clarify that? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll answer what I think your question is, and, and that is, what is the difference between someone who is a web designer and maybe a UX designer? Because I think right. a lot of web right. designers think they're UX designers, and as a UX specialist, I often look at their work and go... Kind of no. Well, they um, so, they want to be because sure. Well, um, also UX is hot. Higher, higher Sometimes rates. UX gets paid more. Sure. Yeah. And, is, and UX, so, is UX front end also? Can you clarify that? You know, is it is front end versus back end like part of what the UX specialty is? Like, whereas a web designer is obviously front end. 
Uh, so UX is typically not coding anything. Um, so, but hypothetically, we might be part of backend decisions because part of UX is information architecture, which has to do with taxonomies, hierarchies, and structures. So sometimes we are collaborating with a backend uh, database person. I mean, for the employees of the company who have to deal with the the content management, right? So, for example, does the UX person ever have a say so in? what that might look like, like a custom post editor and WordPress and stuff. Yeah, so it depends what, what that is. There's a lot of different moving pieces here, and I think we've now asked six questions, so I'm trying to keep track of them sure. all. But um, And we also have the content strategist who often uh, writes the content or handles the content, the UX person. So let me answer my first question, which was, what's the difference between a web designer and a UX designer? And to me, it's not just the title or the pay or the prestige or whatever, but to me, the letter U in UX is for your users. And what I find is the main difference is when a project comes through, let's say you're doing WordPress websites and you've got a client and the client says, I want you to make me a better landing page. And you go, sure, I'm good at this. Here's your better landing page. I would see that as web design. If a client comes to you and says, I wish we understood our customers better so that we could make web pages that make better sense to them naturally. And then if you're a UX practitioner, if you're a researcher, you could say, great, I'm going to spin up some research with 20 or 30 of your users or customers or visitors or target audience who've never seen your website. And I'm going to tell you more about people. I'm going to tell you more about their decision making, their tasks, their processes, their, their preferences and their priorities so that we can build the best website for them. And then before it goes live, I'm going to do usability testing to make sure that we really have built the right thing for people. It's kind of the QA a of UX. And so that's what a UX process looks like in super short and how it's different from web design because uh, many uh, UX designers do start out as web designers, but you would have to be studying more of that psychology and more of how you research or interact with users to really learn from them. Because when we go into interviews, we don't say, hey, what do you want? We don't do that. We have all kinds of psychology-based techniques where, where it's really the science of the thing and it's not, hey, what do you want? Or, hey, if I built a thing that had a thing, would you want it? You know, these are all very bad questions, but are commonly asked by people who really don't know what else to do. So to me, um, there's an overlap for sure. And if people want to be proper UX designers, I would say you're going to need to learn more about cognitive psychology and human behavior, perhaps behavioral economics. And you'll also want to learn some of our proper techniques and approaches and best practices. Uh, yeah. Because if you're just saying, hey, client, I'll just give you whatever you want. We don't see that as, as UX because where was the you, the user? Where's the user in that? Yes. Right. Thank you so much for that, Debbie. And um, I apologise for all the questions that were thrown, but you dealt with it very well, Debbie. Uh, um, so we're going to go for our break and we'll be back in a few moments, folks. We're coming back from our mid-break. Debbie's in, fo in great form, handling okay. Spencer and myself with her plum. Uh, um, answers because I do I do feel like you you not only handled that with a plum but you really did clarify something and it causes me to want to ask you a follow up which yeah is, can I uh, finish can I finish off by uh, uh, before <laughs> <laughs> before you Jonathan uh, and I have never met as you can tell yeah, yeah, we've, never, never, we've never, never been on the same screen but, together no. but before before Spencer answers <laughs> his question um, I would like to point out that if you want to sign up for the WP Tonic newsletter, which um, I send out every Monday, which has an editorial written by myself. Uh, you can do that. Plus, it's got some fantastic stories and all, normally are about what we've discussed on the Friday show. You can get this fantastic weekly newsletter by going to WP Tonic slash newsletter and sign up for that. I suggest that you should do that. So back over to you, Spencer. I can see you're just guarding to give a question to Debbie. So over to you. I, you know, like we're like Felix and Oscar, the odd couple here. We've only known each other like 10 years. Um, it feels like, much longer than it feels same, much longer than that. Spencer. We're still living in the same apartment. Um, okay. So here's what I've heard you say. And I think this is useful because we speak all the time 
to freelance designers. That's again, where you and I share a specialty in the WordPress space in particular. Sounds like what you're saying is UX may not actually have as its primary focus and shouldn't have the design part like a web designer does, but rather it's the human psychology, it's the processes, it's the interacting with people. And perhaps that process may focus primarily on nothing to do with the color schemes and the placement of fonts insofar as they have no effect on the user's use of the web site. If not, then help clarify, because let's say somebody, and here's why I'm asking the question. If somebody was interested in this space in becoming a UX specialist, I understand there's a place to go and obviously your website to talk to you about it, but like understanding the difference between a veterinarian and an optician or something, it's like two different jobs, but they clearly sure. are living in the same building. So let's refine that a little farther. What would a UX specialist be doing on a practical level? Absolutely. You know. Happy to answer that. And for those watching the screen, I've got a little uh, graphic up to help explain it. So actually, UX isn't just one thing. There are multiple subspecialties across UX. And depending upon what you feel you're good at, um, you can just start with one of them. You definitely don't have to learn all of these. It's, it's uncommon to be good at all of these. So feel free to super specialize if you want to get into UX. So we start with research and we start with what's called generative research. This is where we generate information about people, contexts, and systems. So again, I'm just going to give you short versions of things, but if you're curious, you can always ask me more or Tuesdays on my YouTube show at 6.30 PM Italy time is ask me anything. So, you know, we can continue that there, but we start with research and that means specialty researchers. Now, after that, typically we are looking at content and that's where you have your content strategists or your copywriters. I know that the WordPress people interface with some of those people a lot. Sometimes they're from marketing and they're writing the blog posts or, or the other website uh, copy. So that is a UX specialty. You will even see jobs if you go to LinkedIn or other sites for UX writer. It's a thing. And what makes a UX writer different for those of you writers out there is that our specialty is to say it as short as possible. So it's not really a long form style. It is a short form style, especially for what should the button say so people get it and do it um, rather than a, a long form writer for style. the elements on the page. We do. We have is a copywriter. Yeah, we have a cop. We have people who agonize over what a button should say, and sometimes we will A/B test that for weeks. Okay. Then we've got information architecture, which is something you can study. I do recommend the O'Reilly book with the polar bear on the cover. Information Arch architecture for the World Wide Web, the latest edition, I think, came out in 2017 or 18. Uh, O'Reilly book with a polar bear uh, on it. It's long, but it's good, right. and everyone should know information architecture. Even you, web designers and WordPress peeps, you can absolutely put this to good use and you will start making better websites for it, I promise, even if you don't get into UX. Then we've got what we call interaction design. This is when we're making wireframes and prototypes. Now, some people jump right into WordPress and they start making the pages. Some people mock them up, sketch them up, you know, something like that. We call that interaction design because you are designing the interactivity. You're not necessarily doing the visual design or the branding, like you said, the color or the, typ the typography. So when you think of a UX designer, they're typically doing information architecture and interaction design. Then you've, and then we have testing because you want to test it. Sorry, I don't know where I'm on my own screen here. Testing, that's done by a specialized researcher. Sometimes the designer is good at it. Usually the researcher is better at it. And then we've got visual design. And so visual design, sometimes called UI design, maybe some people think of it as brand design. Uh, that's going to be where you have your logo, your colors, your typography, the spacing of elements. It could be a style guide, a component library, a design system, a UI kit. It could be any of those things that we are going to be integrating so that you have that uh, recurring, that's more of the look and feel layer, whereas uh, interaction design can actually be done without that. That's where you hear boxes and arrows, where, you know, we're drawing kind of a blueprint version of the website with placeholders before, uh, before we finalize it. So for those of you web designers curious about UX, you could be looking at research. You could be looking at content strategy and writing. You could be looking at information architecture and interaction design, or if you're more artsy, you could be looking at visual design. That's great, Debbie. Um, I've been watching, I, before this interview, I watched uh, quite a few of your um, 
recent interviews over the past year. Thanks. And I sense um, I sense that the industry feels that it's a little bit in crisis. Um, first of all, would you agree with that statement? And if you do agree with that statement, what do you think are the things that have led to that overall feeling in the industry? Yeah, I think UX is in a bit of trouble because what happens is we're typically hired into companies who don't understand what we do. I mean, even today uh, in this interview, it's true that a lot of people don't understand what we do. I'm here explaining it. You know, it's not like I said, I'm a lawyer and you said, I know what that is. You know, we when we talk about UX, everybody's like, I, I don't know what that is. And we're very often hired into companies and corporate environments and people don't understand what we do and they think we're web designers. They think it's just hi, you're here. Can you move this button over here? And we are problem finders and problem solvers and critical thinkers and, and many lawyers. And so we don't want to just move that button there because we, we want there to be a good reason for that. We want that to solve a real problem. So what happens is a lot of companies don't utilize us correctly. And uh, instead of letting us be problem finders and problem solvers and save the company a lot of risk and waste, they just tell us what to do. Like, you know, you've all had those WordPress gigs where somebody did not want to listen to your advice and they just told you what to do and you had to decide how much do I fight this or do I just take the money? And unfortunately, we see a lot of this in, in our jobs as well, despite some of our specialties and even people with master's degrees and PhDs in this stuff. Do you feel that, <laughs> sorry, John, do you feel that from what you just described, do you feel like that there would be a possibility that a UX person would obviate or remove the need for a web designer in some situations. Because when you it's describe those six different steps or specialties, I was asking myself, now where would a web designer fit into this after you've already got a UX person? Yeah, so it's interesting. The uh, company where I'm consulting right now actually has some separate people doing UX design and uh, WordPress stuff. And actually, the WordPress person is like a little bit more connected to the marketing department. They're updating the uh, the public facing website. They're updating blogs and uh, that sort of long form content. And then the UX designers will go in. So, for example, the company where I'm consulting right now is a job board. So they're kind of a competitor editor to Indeed, if you think about, you know, posting jobs, looking for jobs. And that's the company where I'm uh, consulting right now. In fact, Jonathan is, I believe, from England. It's uh, Total Jobs. And uh, in Germany, it's Stepstone. So that's where I'm consulting right now. And so the, the web designers are handling that kind of marketing content need and, and website need. And then the UX designers design the job board system. So the web designers aren't necessarily the right people to go in and say, here's how we design the best way for a candidate to apply for a job. Because now you got to get into that psychology of the process that a candidate would like. To, I mean, think about yourself. If you've ever applied for a job, it sucked, right? And it was awful and it was too long and you wanted to throw your computer out the window. The UX researcher needs to look into what's going on with that, as I like to say, are people, contexts and systems. And then the designers would take the knowledge from the researchers and they would be able to um, say, OK, this is the best way for someone to apply to search for a job, find a job, apply for the job. And it's real. That's where a lot of that psychology comes in. So I think there are places in companies for both people. So web designers can be web designers, even if they don't want to get into UX. And there will always be need for WordPress specialists and web designers. I mean, that's what my boyfriend's been doing for decades and, and he can make a full time living at it. I mean, that's great. What That's you're great. There, an imp, just what, maybe you're saying they're like an implementer. So in other words, the UX person is sort of mapping out all the important details to hand off to a, an implementer who's a WordPress specialist. And then they so to, actually in, in the case of most corporate environments, the UX designer is not handing off to a WordPress person. The UX designer is handing off to an engineering team who builds the functionality right. because typically something like a job board website or a LinkedIn or whatever doesn't have WordPress as its platform. The WordPress platform exists for the public facing website and the blog and the careers page and the come work for us and about us and all of those things. But once we get into the actual product, that's usually 
usually not built on a WordPress platform that's usually custom coded by the company. Um, and that so usually the UX people are not necessarily dealing with the, the WordPress people. The UX people are talking directly to Agile and Scrum teams who are then doing the back end and front end coding and, and APIs and services and things like that. Yeah, we're going to be wrapping up the podcast part of the show. Hopefully, Debbie will stay on with us for another 10, 15 minutes for our bonus, sure. con bonus content. Um, you can watch the whole interview plus the bonus content on the WP Tonic YouTube channel. Please go over there and watch the whole interview plus the bonus content. Debbie's got a fantastic YouTube channel. She's very... Um, generous with her time and if you're interested in what we've discussed I would um, say definitely go over to Debbie's YouTube channel I'll, it, that will be in the show notes on the WP Tonic website so Debbie um, what is the best way for people to contact you and learn more about you I, I would imagine you're going to say the YouTube channel all the things, you know, deltacx.com, which of course is a WordPress website, uh, though it's, you know, in sad need of updating, you know, dentist's teeth, well, you got somebody they say. You better get him on it, have you? I've, well, he's great, and, and he's awesome, and I highly recommend him, but I have to write the content, so, you know, I am his, uh, I am his blocker, as they say. Um, but yeah, deltacx.com, though in need of updated content, you can find me on LinkedIn as uh, Debbie Levitt, uh, D-E-B-B-I-E-L-E. -E v like victor itt and of course my youtube channel is called delta cx and i'm usually live three or four times a week uh, with various shows on monday i teach design on tuesday i take questions on wednesday i usually do interviews or discussions and on friday we make fun of wacky crap that's <laughs> great and spencer what's the best way for people to find out more about you and what you're up to spencer uh wplaunchify.com that's great. Um, in the bonus content, I've got my own um, thoughts about why the UX is in crisis. Uh, interesting fact, listeners and viewers, I did my degree in UX design and I did my master in this subject. Um, so I know a little bit about it. Um, we'll be back next week with another fabulous guest like Debbie. We'll see you soon, folks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. So, Debbie, um, I personally, you know, obviously everything we discussed here, um, I kind of link it to the crisis of usability as well. You know, it's been an ongoing um, discussion, um, caused a lot of upset in the WordPress community around how WordPress, um, WordPress has gone through a dramatic change over the past couple of years. And a lot of people were criticised because usability was really put down to literally the bottom of this redesign process on WordPress, around WordPress, and it caused a lot of argument and upset in the WordPress community. I've but, heard. Um, and um, I think it's really linked to what we've discussed around UX design because I think fundamentally this is about money. Um, and the allocation of resources. There is always um, a limitation unless you're dealing with highly financed large companies. But even then, that, um, that will affect profitability, time scales, cost. And real deep UX design, when it's linked to a well-financed product project, um, it's a cost saving. It's a cost saving not doing usability testing. And it's seen as a cost saving not really spending the time resources around UX. Would you agree with that fundamental statement? I think there's some, uh, first of all, we have to say that we don't know what automatic is doing or not doing. So we're just speculating. But mm. I would say that what often happens at companies is that if they don't, if they don't truly understand UX or good UX, if they're not customer centric, they bring in UX and they ask them to make something pretty. 
Um, and, and then we definitely sacrifice the usability. And of course, I know a lot of, uh, not a lot, I know some of what's been happening behind the scenes with 5.8 and 5.9 and Gutenberg because of my boyfriend's involvement um, with it. And, uh, um, and so uh, we did a, he did a show on my channel teaching everybody how to make their UX portfolio in WordPress with, with blocks and such. Um, so I think that I can't speak for what's happening at Automatic. I have no inside knowledge, but I, I did hear about usability issues and accessibility issues. Um, I know that my boyfriend and other people are putting in tickets and and getting things fixed and um, okay. and that they're looking for more people to keep trying Gutenberg and 5.9 and, and help get it fixed. And so in this case, it's taking a community to right the wrongs but I think it would be important for Automatic to take a, a fresh look at, at the UX team. And it's always hard from the outside to know whether they've hired the right people and they're not empowered and, and they're thought of in, in, uh, you know, incorrectly or whether they haven't hired the right people and, and the not right people are doing the best that they can. Mm. So yeah, but, you know, it takes an but, insider to know. Yeah, before I throw it over to Spencer for his comment, um, this is my opinion, Debbie. Um, I, I, I'm an actual. I know a lot of people are going to be falling off the chair now that are part of the tribe. I actually do support Gutenberg, and um, but in UX design terms, I, I personally feel it's a total disaster, Debbie. Um, a train wreck of UX design, mostly because I see. Uh, that it's fundamentally from its concept has been designed by developers who had very little understanding of fundamental UX design principles, and it shows all over it. Um, and being that we're dealing with a company of the size of Automatic and the financial resources, I personally feel it's a disgrace, but that's my uh, opinion. Over to you, Spencer. What, what's your thoughts and questions about this? <laughs> But other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? <laughs> and when do you want to get married, WordPress? Um, so... <laughs> Why won't they sponsor you're my show? You're ugly and your hair looks funny, but otherwise you're really hot. Um, here's, here's, here's where I think the connection point to what you're describing today, which I do find rather fascinating, hits the road. The rubber's hitting the road. I think that one of the benefits of WordPress becoming more oriented towards the, the Gutenberg editor and the block builder is something you touched upon, which is in a corporate environment, acknowledged, there's really like a sliver of what's done through a WordPress CMS. And the rest is done through Agile and other kinds of methodologies with fancy development cycles and so forth. But for a lot of people in the solopreneur to small SMB market, they're still using WordPress as a primary framework for what their business runs upon. So what I'm pulling out of what you're saying today is for freelancers, a marketplace that I served and taught for the first 10 plus years of WordPress, maybe eight, is that there are opportunities that exist today being a UX specialist by bringing the sensibilities you can share and teach to the clients and letting them understand that the pain solution they need is not going to come from hiring some nameless fa faceless person who snaps together a pre-made theme but rather understanding the entire user experience and approaching it from your expertise level much like joking aside understanding that the secret to a happy relationship is not in buying flowers on valentine's day or going to this movie but understanding the nature of what the other person wants and approaching it from the bottom up and so from that standpoint my question is even though you talked about the corporate, could you give some kind of a, like a quick touch point of what a freelancer might look for in the WordPress space that would be a starting point to hang the hat on? And what kind of charges might somebody get for that kind of thing on a, a small business owner or a website owner? Yeah, so I think that, th that this is a bit of a... Um a bit of a tightrope because very often, especially as freelancers, the types of WordPress jobs you're getting, they might be, and I'm just going to use American dollars. They might be $500. They might be $2,000. You know, they're, oh you know, these aren't going to be $50,000 websites. What were you saying, Spencer? I'm saying I agree with you. So let's set the premise that most WordPress yep. websites are 
2500 to $5,000. But one of the things you discussed was the distinction in a large environment between a web designer and a UX. Is it possible for a freelancer to do both and approach the project like a UX person and charge for that value, that benefit? Can they distinguish it like an SEO person might or a, a social media person might? Okay, so there's kind of three questions in there. So one is, can the the WordPress person approach something like a UX designer? The second question is, can they charge for that? And the third question is kind of what? How much? Can they do that and in so, a space where the budget is small? You wanted a fourth question. Okay, why not? Oh, okay, so, no. so, no, it's okay. <laughs> They're free. No, Keep asking. Um this is, see, this is, this is, look, I'm only pointing this out because when we do interviews and UX research, we want to make sure to not ask somebody more than one question at a time. It's why a lot of people aren't great at UX research because people love to pile on questions. And I do that in my everyday life. But then when I get into UX research remote, I have to watch to not do that. We call them double barrel questions or triple barrel in this case. And so if, let's start with, can a web designer bring UX uh, uh, principles and techniques into their WordPress business? Business? And the answer is absolutely, but I want to make sure you know what the heck you're doing, because what I find are there are web designers out there who don't know poop about UX. They they watch some crappy YouTube video from someone who should not be on YouTube. The, you know, well, they don't be watching your they don't be watching your channel. I, they I wanna, they watch I wanna, my channel. They I, they, I wanna, they watch I some pause. charlatan. But let me pause because I feel like I asked the question badly, and I think you fairly pointed out. Could you approach the question from the standpoint, is there an opportunity for a freelancer who specializes in WordPress to become a UX specialist within the scope of small projects? That would be my one question. I think that would help to sort it out. Okay, so becoming there? a UX specialist takes years. So this is not something that is a fast or easy upskill. If you uh -huh. want something that is an upskill that is really going to help your business, I would say get certified in accessibility because so many American companies are now being sued for being inaccessible. And accessibility is the right thing to do morally and ethically, but it's something that almost no WordPress expert seems to know about. They don't really know how to make a site work for or uh, motion, vision, hearing, cognitive issues, memory issues, and other issues. And this, if you're in America, this is the ADA law. And in other right. countries, you have your own laws. I would say that people should get the first step before you try to become a UX specialist, which will take years, but you can do it, is uh, learn accessibility. And don't fall for excessive B or any of these overlays. People are getting sued for these overlays. You cannot WordPress plug in accessibility. Accessibility has to be baked in from the very start at, at the foundation of the framework. And sure, you can throw in a plug in for skip for uh, tab skip navigation. But other than that, you're going to have to understand accessibility and bake the right things in. You're going to need focus states for your form fields. You're going to need to be able to tab through a website for people who don't use a mouse. You're going to not have uh, to, re you can't rely on hover states and mouse overs because people who don't use a mouse don't see them and people on mobile don't see them. So I would love to see uh, WordPress freelancers and, and entrepreneurs learning accessibility and learning mobile design better because you don't have to be a UX expert for that, but you can still uh, that is still marketable to your client. I'm I mean, going to make that's sure. That's a brilliant idea, get, by the way. Just that alone. Uh, yeah. I'm going to make sure you don't get sued for inaccessibility yeah. because I'm yeah. going to make sure people with screen readers can use this and go out there and test these people's websites with screen readers. Don't just claim it and don't just use a plugin and don't just run wave on it. Do it right. Don't do accessibility by plugin. Those people are getting sued. Google it. So, uh, you know, that uh, I would say start with accessibility and better mobile design. I thought that was fantastic, Debbie. Thank you, and you, you're Thanks. handling you're handling Spencer very well as well. Oh, um, but he, he, he's not. He, but he's not. But she, he's not. On. She's speaking my language because I love what she's saying, and what I was trying to get at, which I love your answer, is can we have a takeaway for the audience that listens to us, which are WordPress freelancers who are facing a changing market? Your answer was brilliant because that's Thank the you. takeaway. UX, yeah. I heard you say, is a long. It's a process. It's years in the making. And for right. any it's not realistic a fast person, that's an enterprise or a large corporate position. But for right. the freelancer in the WordPress space, 
you could build a business on being a specialist of accessibility, which we talk Absolutely. about all the time. So yeah. that was yeah. perfect. Perfect. Yeah, to, for I, sure. I, hopefully, you, you don't know, have to be a UX expert. Hopefully, um, to finish off, I just want to put this question to you, Debbie. Uh, sure. um, I'm, and I want to frame it first quickly. Um, I, I'm going to put this question, but I am no way saying that it will reduce the need to have knowledge about the subject and somebody to apply the knowledge. Do you think artificial intelligence can be utilised in the testing process so to reduce the cost a bit? So the, pro, the whole process which we have attempted in this interview to describe can be applied to smaller projects because obviously the whole process which you have described is um, for obvious reason costly because it, there's a lot of time has to be spent on it and it's out of the budget of a lot of people um, but they still know it's really important can artificial intelligence do you think or do you think it's a total buzzword and it will never help in reducing the time element not remove the knowledge element of of a, of an individual that practice in this area there we okay this time i've i've didn't make my mistake. I wrote down what you said. So let's um, answer the second thing first. So when we talk about UX being costly or out of budget, I always ask people to compare that to the crappy mistakes they're making right now. And how many times have people had to redo their website thousands of dollars each time when they could have just known the first time what was the right thing to do? You know, a website's never going to be perfect. There's always going to be a way to make it better, but these could suck way less. And, and I think the we have to compare the cost of uh, better research and knowledge up front uh, to the absolute waste and uh, uh, possible customer loss when we release something that isn't a good match to customers. So let's cross out that. That one's covered. Now let's talk about AI. So AI, um, really when we talk about AI, we're talking about ML. We're talking about machine learning because we don't truly have a lot of artificial intelligence yet, but we do have good machine learning where the machines can be trained trained on particular models and then can emulate those models. Now, I don't believe that AI is going to take anybody's UX job anytime soon, um, especially in the area of research and testing, because the reality is that the, the, if we, you know, this is like design thinking again, Ooh, Debbie in a box, you know, just drink this and you're Debbie. And, and I think we, you know, we hear the same things around AI and, and ML where the, the, the thing is, could, could um, AI run a usability test on a website? I guess so. Will the AI correctly interpret it? Will the AI see the things that I see when people are using a website? Will the AI hear the changes in people's voices? Will the AI hear them sigh and pause and know what that means? And or know the follow-up question to ask. Now, you're to, you might be talking about an unmoderated study where it runs uh, on its own and then we get the videos later and we watch the videos. So that would still, we still, we already have unmoderated testing, which is very fast and very inexpensive. I can run that in a day if I know what I'm doing, but I don't think AI is going to be a help here. And I think, don't think it's the best use of it. Like, you know, can AI please cure cancer now? You know, can AI fix coronavirus? Well, I don't need AI to do, to do usability testing or user research. I'm going to do that way better because this is science and psychology. And that's like the psychology is the opposite. It, you know, of, of making computers do this. So I would say let's focus our AI in uh, healthcare and places where it's going to really save lives and matter. And let's keep the, the, the human and human centered design. Um, so I don't believe that uh, I do see companies claiming that AI and whatever can uh, help their customer experience, but, but I'm not buying into that because I, I believe that we have to keep the H in, in human experience. Yeah. I mean, you're someone in the chat room is saying, I, AI can do some record keeping and some data analysis. Sure. But we also know that AI models get trained badly very quickly with bad data. We have the reports of yeah. AI models not recognizing certain ethnicities. We have the report. Don't forget them. What was it? Microsoft ran that experiment where they had AI Twitter and the, and the, the Twitter <laughs> AI bot became racist within an hour because the, the models were 
were racist. So, you know, we're not there yet. No, I don't think so. But the reason I I, uh, I thought I would put it to you, because I'm sure somebody in your industry is going to pass all this and they'll plaster AI all over it to flog it. Uh, um, but also, it's a bit like web design, because there was a company trying to flog that you could build your whole website using AI technology. And you, you put build in a form and boom, and it would produce it. And... It all sounds fantastic, doesn't it, Debbie? Like most You'll get what you pay for there. Remember, you know, whenever I lose a client to crazy crap like that, like when I back when I was more of a web designer, um, and I used to use lose clients to, well, I'm gonna have my dog walkers, manicurists, postman's cousin do it because he's got front page. You know, what I would always say is, Well, we fix mistakes. You know, so if it doesn't work out well, just come back and you know, we'll we'll fix it or we'll redo it. And I can't tell you how many people came to us and were like, oh, can you fix my website? And I'm like, this can't be fixed. Like, this has to be redone. So, you, do. you know. Yeah, it's, hey. a bit, it's a bit like my last marriage, really, David. Flash. There we go. Dreamweaver websites? Uh, I'm like, sorry, what, Spencer? Your, your, I heard fla that. your Flash and Dreamweaver website? Yeah, <laughs> you know, we never did that. We, uh, I mean, I still have Dreamweaver, and I do hand HTML. But, but yeah, we didn't get into Flash, luckily. We, we went in a different direction with, uh, with our stuff in, in those years. But, um, yeah, so, yeah, not for me and not for you. And, and I would say to all of you freelancers out there, this doesn't compete against you because you compete on quality. You don't, if you compete on speed, it's a race to the bottom, and you're going to lose money. You need to compete on quality. Thank you, Debbie. I've really enjoyed the conversation, Debbie. Are you, um, I've, I knew it was going to be an interesting interview. Hopefully you'll agree to come back later on at the end of the year. Because sure. um, um, I'm fascinated. Debbie on the WP Tonic Roundup show on Fridays so if she's not conflicting with her show. That would be uh, uh, oh, yeah, if you're up for it, Debbie, I'd love you to come on the Round Table show. Um, um, I'm sure you would cope with that fantastically we're gonna end it now folks and <laughs> we i would talk... cope with that <laughs> well you need to watch one Is your, you? does your show cause emotional hardship <laughs> we go we go we go places other shows might not go as spencer would put it uh we're gonna end it now debbie uh thank you so much we'll see you soon tribe bye thanks bye